Let's get our Bibles, and, um, and we're going to jump in. I, I need to see, and I need everyone, once I ask you to lift your hands, uh, you've got to put them up high and hold them up just for a second so I can actually do a, a, a status check here. But uh, I'm very curious, just moving forward, um, how many of you were here last weekend, either on Saturday night or one of our two Sunday morning services? Lift a hand if you were here. Okay. 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 There's pockets that weren't. Okay. I uh, would encourage you to do something, um, and that is to go online to our website and listen. There's a, a, vo- a podcast. It's audio. Or to watch. You can look at the video as well. Uh, you need to dedicate probably an, an hour. Well, I, I don't say probably an hour. It's exactly an hour long. It's an hour. I talked last week for an hour, okay? Um, so you need to set aside some time, but one person I was talking to uh, said, man, it felt like, like 20 minutes. It just went, it just went by. Um, it, it's really important that you would watch that or listen to it, and um, we really prayerfully considered whether or not we would put that particular teaching online. And it took us a few days. If you were looking for it throughout the week, you know it didn't really arrive until Thursday. It took us that long to kind of process, what, what, should we do this or should we not? And, and it's because of the content in which I delivered last week. Now, uh, here's what I believe the Lord's asked me to do. Before we jump into the text, and we're going to get into the scripture this morning, but here's what I, I know beyond a shadow of a doubt the Lord's asked me to do, and it's to review, just to review, not to go back and rehash, but to review uh, two things from last week. Just two things for our church. And if you were here, you know what I said. It was a very significant weekend um, that the Lord moved pretty mightily here. But if you weren't, then I'll just say, um, I'm sorry, I can't give you more context to what I'm about ready to tell you. But other than to say that God really kind of begun and carried forward a, a really significant and deep work in my heart. And when I say begun, the reality is, is it's so funny because once you kind of come to this understanding with the Lord and he just does things in you, you can look back and go, well, you really didn't begin that two days ago. You began that so long ago. And I kind of missed the things that you were doing or ignored it or I bounced it off as coincidence. Things I even teach you not to do. And yet it was happening in my own heart. You may say, well, is that the epitome of hypocrisy? Yeah, it really is. It really is. And, and so I was able to look back and go, wow, look at all the things you've been doing, Lord, wooing my heart towards this, and yet I was missing it. So I just need to, to very simply say God did a significant work. Now, two things I need to review, uh, just because the Lord prompted my heart to say these things. I spoke last week, uh, and I won't belabor this, but I spoke last week about having feelings um, in my in my gut and in my mind and my heart. It was, I was wrestling a lot of stuff and I had these feelings and I said it very bluntly to you. I didn't soft sell it of like, I'm just wanting to take my life three times over the last couple of weeks. And I want to just tell you that the, what, in case you misunderstood, after an extended time of confession, I'm giggling, there's nothing funny about suicide. But in, for me, I giggle because after an extended time of confession and healing, I can tell you with, with every amount of certainty, I I actually had no plan, nor do I have the means actually to do that. And there's no threat currently. I've had a few of you very concerned, like, hey man, how about we check you in to a mental (laughs) hospital, okay? No, 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 that's not the case. And and I don't expect everyone, I don't expect 100% of you to understand this, but I think a good percentage of you will understand what I'm about ready to describe. It isn't so much about the actual event of, of wanting to die. It's about just not wanting to move forward. It's that idea of like, Lord, if this just kind of ended, I would be okay. Um, gosh, I love my wife, but she's a solid gal. She can do this. Um, man, I love, my, I love my kids, but well, they're all serving Jesus, and that's great. I kind of did my part there. And you know, you see what I'm saying? And, and really, the uh, a way to describe it without, again, belaboring this is Think about Elijah in the Old Testament. Remember Elijah at the top of Mount Carmel? I mean, defeats the prophets of Baal, the prophets of Asherah, defeats as in kills all of them, and then runs down the hill, beats the chariot to the bottom of Mount Carmel, and then goes into the wilderness about a day's hike in, and then crawls under a broom tree. You've heard me teach on this story before. Crawls under a broom tree and says, Lord, I want to die. Okay, it's that. It's that kind of just overwhelmed, just like, I don't know, I don't know what else to do. And then the Lord came by with that still small voice, right? It wasn't in the thunder. It's basically the essence of everything I talked about last week. 
I just I couldn't find God in all the loud. I just needed to bring my heart to him and say, Lord, I'm broken. Uh, think about Solomon and Ecclesiastes. Think about Jeremiah. Think about Ezekiel. Think about Joel, the prophet. Think about Jonah. I mean, even think about some references that Paul makes. If you really just look at it through your eyes, you go, wow, Paul, you walked through some stuff here. And if, and if you're not convinced yet, let me just take, put the nail in the, well, nail in the coffin. That's probably not. Um, <laughs> Let me just drive this home. There is a book in the Bible of lament. It's called Lamentations. It's a book in the Bible, and there are times when you just have to just allow the Lord to just to, just to hear your heart. And, and, um, and I cried out to the Lord, and here's what Psalm 30 says. David says, Lord, my God, I called to you for help, and you healed me. Yes, Lord. You brought me up from the realm of the dead. You spared me from going down to the pit. And in reality, I, I kind of needed to go to the pit. You know, we talk about this with our children. Sometimes they just have to hit rock bottom, right? We, you, we talk about this. And yet when it happens to you, you're like, oh, I want to avoid that at all costs. There's just some things you can't avoid. You've got to get to the very bottom of who you are and then go, wow, Lord, I, I really, really, really need you now. Okay, I thought... I could get on and do my own business and make this happen on my own. I couldn't do that. And so that's the first thing I need to review with you. The second thing is this. I really felt like the Lord wanted me just to tell, tell you this, that this is no longer about, don't hear me, with all sensitivity, this is no longer about me. Okay, it's, this isn't about me. So don't fixate on my story. Okay, fixate on God's story and how it connects to you, all right? And how it connects to you. I, I, know, I know with 100% certainty, as your pastor, I needed to promptly and humbly declare, I'm going to put that in air quotes in case you, can't, you aren't watching, de declare, like not just internally hold on to something like Mary in the New Testament pondered it in her heart. I needed to, like the angels in that story, declare it. I had to declare it humbly but promptly that I was discerning the ploy of the enemy for me and for our church, but also the power of God to, to heal and to restore. I mean, that's what I had to do, and I knew it. And I've had individuals very kindly say that must have been very difficult. It was a very difficult week, yes, but to get up in front of you was not difficult at all last week. It was, I had so much peace in my heart just to be able to express these things because I knew it was what God wanted me to do. Now, this is where it's about you and about God. I'm not doing that just to take the eyes off me, uh, but as a leader, I needed to take the lid off of our church that I had placed there, really in a spiritual sense, and just take it off and go, all right, now what are you gonna do with this? So here's the reason why I knew it was about you. It's because all week long, uh, you've been showing me that. You've been sending notes and cards and different things about what God's doing in your life. I, I mean, literally hundreds of you hundreds. So do you know, ever notice how the word literally actually in the common vernacular in our culture means figuratively? You know, I'm literally dying here. You know, well, no, you're figuratively dying. You're literally not dying. You see what I'm saying? It's so weird how we've twisted these words, you know, bad is good and you know, that kind of stuff. Okay. But, and I'm an exaggerator by nature, but the Lord's really been convicting me on this. I can tell you literally and not be exaggerating. I've told you once, I've told you a thousand times, stop exaggerating, okay? No, I can tell you, literally hundreds of people are drawing near to God in various ways, various ways, okay? And many people are resonating with what the Lord's been doing and the season that we're in. An example, I got this email. Remember last week, if you were here, I talked about, it. I talked about it. the rainbow that come blasting through my car uh, in Woodburn as I'm driving back from something, and I just, at the presence of God was so overwhelming. Um, I, I want to just uh, tell you this email I got. This email from a church family member here said, Pastor John, I saw that same rainbow, and it literally changed the color of my living room. We all ran outside to see the spectacle of lights, God's promise, and a hope for the future. Then she referred to the Beth Moore study that the gals are in. She says, in the Beth Moore study that we, we learned, quote, courage is not the absence of fear. It's the knowledge that something greater exists, and that is God. Thank you for your transparency today. Oh, and here's the photo of the rainbow that split through the car on the freeway. Is that crazy? 
Now, when I was trying to describe this to you, some of you thought I was like talking about a figurative set of lights that was like all of a sudden I just saw the light, you know, in my car. No, that thing split through my car and I thought the cops were pulling me over. And I'm just telling you, I, I, it's not photoshopped. I, I just look at the arc over the house. It's just like, and here's the deal. I, we know that in scripture, the rainbow was the promise from God that he would never flood us with water ever again. But I, here's why I want to fast forward now to the book of Acts, is he is declared, he will though flood us with his presence. He will. He's going to pour it out on his sons and his daughters. His old men are going to dream dreams. Young men are going to have visions. The presence of God is very, very alive. And I needed to tell you that because I wanted to show you that there are people, that's just one of hundreds of notes and emails and messages and things from people that have had their hearts get illuminated by the things of God. Okay? So there's my two points of review. You ready to jump in the Bible? Okay, here we go. Jeremiah chapter 17. Jeremiah 17, with Old Testament prophets, and kind of right about the middle of your Bible, Psalms, Song of Solomon, Isaiah, you're kind of in that area, okay? Jeremiah 17, I'm really, really, really excited to get into this passage. But I need to tell you why we're in Jeremiah 17, okay? And to do that, I got to tell you a series of stories. True stories, by the way, true stories, okay? On October 2015, October 2015, I scheduled uh, in uh, a retreat that I go on every October, I scheduled out a three-part series that would happen right now called Rooted, okay? And each week had its own uh, focus scripture. Um, each week um, had a title, a subtitle, scripture, subscripture, and then even if, if you understand preaching, you, I, had, I had a whole column on my Excel worksheet that I've been using for many, many years of just like thoughts or ideas or illustrations or, you know, things that I just was thinking about about that particular week. And um, in the process of laying that all out for right now, I'd ask my best friend, Tim Clark, to be here when he, or to be at the church while he was up here for uh, one of our pastor's weddings. And he was here just two weeks ago. And I said to him, would you speak out of Psalm chapter one, Psalm one? And he said, absolutely, I love that passage and I'll, I'll teach out of that. And then I put down on my Excel worksheet that the next week, uh, Rooted Part Two, I would speak out of Mark chapter four. Now, if you were here last week, I did indeed speak out of Mark chapter four. And then I put on the last week that I was going to three-part series leading up to Easter that I was gonna speak out of Jeremiah chapter 17. Now, how did I come up with Jeremiah 17, Mark chapter four, and Psalm one? I'm going to admit something to you right now. I have just an open book. And here we are. I Googled root, rooted, Bible. Okay? So you're thinking, so that's what we pay you the bucks for. <laughs> that's what you're doing, right? Okay? But you already have context now because of what I talked to you about last week. Okay? I just Googled it. I Googled it. And then, as I've told the story last week, God deeply got a hold of my hard heart. Okay, you can only do that so long, and it's going to just press down, compact the soil of your heart, and you just aren't hearing God really anymore. You aren't hearing him speak. Friends, this isn't a slogan. I'm not just trying to give you something to tweet out right now. I'm telling you, God knows more than Google. God knows more than Google. And what had happened was I began to fear the Lord more than man, okay? And the fear of the Lord is the beginning of all wisdom. We know that from the scripture. Now, by God's abundant grace, I was still able to look at Mark chapter four, but not see it through the eyes of Google because that was one of a few passages in the scripture that used the word root or rooted to match some series I was able to, with wisdom, be able to look at Mark chapter 4 last week and actually see the condition of my heart, the soil conditions, those four conditions that we taught on last week, and have it completely explode in me. And then today, I was reminded, for t last night and for today at our services, I was reminded of Jeremiah 17, but I was reminded of it in a very interesting way. Here's my second story. It was at Starbucks. 
and I went in very early this last Tuesday morning, and there was a man that I see there frequently who happened to be sitting in the corner. I was a little bummed because that's my seat right there in the corner. <laughs> it's, got, it's where the plug-in. Man, you all know, if you go to coffee shops, they're limited plug-ins. You gotta be able to go to the right seat. And so I saw him there, and I waved, and I was a little frustrated, but I went and grabbed my coffee, and I came back, and we talked. And he doesn't attend our church, but he says, I've heard, this is last Tuesday, coming off of last weekend, he goes, I've heard what the Lord's doing in your life. I said, how did you hear about this? Dude, it's just people are talking. And I heard about what's going on in your church. And he says, um, he says there, right then, at 7.45 a.m., I'm going to give you legitimate times here so I don't, I don't mess up the timeline because it's all, everything's very clear in my head. But 7.45 a.m., he stopped me to say, my wife and I, we're, we're praying for you, and we've been praying for some extended time for you and for your church, and man, it's just amazing to hear what God's doing. He, and, and we talked some more, and I just unpacked it. I just sat down, as I've been doing all week long. It's just like, I just, hey, let me just tell you more of the context. It's just, uh, this is so cool. God's doing blah, blah, blah in our church. And he goes, wait a second. He grabbed his phone, and he flipped through something. He says, my wife sent me something this morning. At, and he looked at the timestamp on his phone, 644 this morning. He said, my wife just sent me this scripture, texted me a verse from her devotions. And then uh, we talked some more about it, and I looked at it closer as he, and I said, wait a second, what is that verse? And we expanded it and looked at it, and I go, Jeremiah 17, huh, why does that ring a bell? <laughs> and then after talking a bunch at 8.20 in the morning, he says, well, I'm going to forward this to you right now. Give me your number. And he forwarded it to me, and he sent me this. This scripture verse he sent me, and it popped up on my phone. He sent me, watch how this is going to work again. He sent me this. <laughs> and then he sent me this. <laughs> yes. <laughs> you guys are busted back there. I see what you're, they're like, hmm. Um, and I got this on my phone, and I said, man, I recognize this verse. I said, hold on one second. And I grabbed my computer, and I opened up my Excel uh, worksheet, and I looked, and week three, rooted part three, Jeremiah 17, five through eight. And it was everything that was highlighted on this verse. And I said to him, man, you have no idea, but this is the key verse I knew I was supposed to teach on six, seven months ago this weekend, and it's this verse I want to take you to right now. Let's look at Jeremiah 17, five through eight, and you have to know this is what the Lord says. So, in fact, if you have your Bibles, you're going to notice in verse 5, it actually says, this is what the Lord says, okay? This is what the Lord says. And I want to show you the verse on the screen, and it's in two columns, because I want you to capture some side-by-side -side images of what's taking place within this passage. Let's read it together, starting verse 5. This is what the Lord says. Cursed is the one who trusts in man who draws strength from mere flesh and whose heart turns away from the Lord. That person will be like a bush in the wastelands. They will not see prosperity when it comes. They will dwell in parched places of the desert in a salt land where, there, where no one lives. Now, by the way, let's just let out just a collective kind of, ugh, because that's really what's being described there, right? Ugh, gross. It's salty, it's parched. There's no prosperity, there's no, it's, there's just bushes running around with wasteland all around. I mean, there, it's flesh, it's trusting in man, and it all hinges on this, this, this curse right here. It begins with a curse. Okay, but let's, let's move forward. But, blessed is the one who trusts in the Lord, whose confidence is in him. They'll be like a tree planted by water that sends out its roots to the stream. It does not fear when heat comes. It, its leaves are always green, and it has no worries in a year of drought and never fails to bear, what? What? Say it aloud. Fruit. Never fails to bear fruit. Now, now, I want you to understand something about the context of this passage of Scripture. Because if you were to look back in your Bibles to verses 1 through 4, you're going to notice that there's the context of Israel's hard heart. Israel's heart was very hard. Judah, it refers to Judah. That was a, a, a split kingdom, Judah and Israel. Uh, Judah's sin, it says, is engraved with an iron tool. It's inscribed with a flint point on the tablets of their heart. In other words, you look at them and you just see sin. 
okay? And it goes on, talks about the fact that they're, they were hard-hearted and they were given away their plunder and they worshiped in the high places and, and they're gonna lose the inheritance that was given to them and being enslaved among their people. And God's anger was towards them. I mean, this was really, really devastating. It's ugly stuff that was taking place there. But lest we just look at this and say, well, those stinking Israelites just couldn't get it together. No, this is us. As a matter of fact, I'm going to make a statement that is, it has a political tinge to it. And yet, you have to understand from this place, from this platform, from this pl- pulpit, whatever, we would rarely, if ever, address political things, okay? You're not going to get a position statement from me. You're not going to hear who I'm voting for. I'm not going to drive you towards something like that. That's between you and God. Here's what I can tell you is we will call upon the name of the Lord, okay? We will pray for those that are in leadership. We will pray for those that, uh, that, uh, that serve us. But we, I won't give you political commentary except for right now, at this very moment. Here it is, ready? And I'm gonna just say a brief statement and then I'll stop lest I go further and then we're all in trouble, okay? All right, here it is. Friends, as I look across the landscape of where we are right now, we are getting what we deserve. Now let that settle in for a second. We're getting what we deserve. I'm not making a comment about this party or that party, this person or that person or who's in and who's out or who should be in or who should be out. No, we're getting what we deserve, friends, because we are a hard-hearted people and sin has been engraved upon us. Okay, this is our, this is our land. And we can look and we decry cry it all day long, but this is us. We are it. And we're getting what we deserve. And so, I better stop there. Okay, so you see what I'm saying? When I look at this place that we found ourselves in, and Israel's representative of this, we've got to then come to the Lord, and we've got to say, God, what does this mean, and how do we walk this out? And that's what brings us to Jeremiah 17, 5 through 8 now. This passage is simply amazing. And this thing, I, I know I Googled it six months ago, but I'm telling you, the Lord just went, boom, I'm, gonna, I'm just gonna expound on this in your heart this week. And so what I wanna talk to you about is the things that I found to be so awesome about this passage. It's so amazing, uh, I think primarily because of something I discovered this week as I was reading it, just over and over and over. I saw that it's, it's a mirror. It's a mirror, it's a mirror image. That's why we put it in two columns for you so you could see it. And this mirror hinges on, it pivots on one word, but. I think the word but is probably the most amazing word in the Bible. I mean, I could say other than Jesus. We know some of the, the, the God, Father, those, but but. And by the way, I speak to junior hires all the time. This is not a junior high thing. I'm not talking about with two T's. I'm not. I'm not. I'm talking about just the word, but. This is a powerful word. And you see it all throughout scripture. It is the pivot word. Okay, let me give you an example. Uh, let me show you something out of Ephesians. So you don't turn there, but it'll take, it'll take you too long to get there. But Ephesians, oh, Ephesians 2, here it is. As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins, in which you used to live when you followed the ways of the world and the rulers of the kingdom of the air and the spirits that are now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us who lived among them at one time, we lived among them. We gratified the, the, the cravings of our flesh. We followed the, the desires and thoughts of our flesh. And like the rest of them, we were by nature uh, objects of wrath, one version says, or deserving of wrath of God. Okay, that's verses one through three of Ephesians two. But then verse four, <laughs> This is so cool. But God. Friends, we should all make t-shirts and all it should say on it is, but God. I mean, think about this. Okay, but God, because of his great love for us, who is rich in mercy, he made us alive in Christ even when we were dead in our transgressions. It is by grace that you have been saved. Everyone say, but God, go. (laughs) But God. The word but, this is the hinge. This is the pivot. Oh my goodness. When we look at this mirror today and you start to see how it comes together and if we were to fold it like, to get like this, we're gonna notice how each line lines up. Go with me. If you got something to write down, you can capture these six statements that become a mirror. 
to each other. Okay, here we go. Let's begin with the first opening words. Cursed, blessed. Cursed, blessed. Okay, this is where we start. On one side, this is what's going to happen. You're going to be cursed. On this other side, this is where blessing comes from. Now, friends, I, 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 don't, I don't know all of you personally, but I can make this conclusive statement in this room, and I know it for a fact. I don't know anyone in this room that would willfully choose a curse over a blessing. I don't know anyone in this room that you would willfully choose a curse over a blessing, and yet, now here's the catch, and yet, I mean, let's just do a quick show of hands. Who, who wants to be blessed over being cursed? Right, raise your hand. Blessing over cursing that looks like 100%. Okay. And yet, here's the kick in the teeth. We live in such a way that produces the natural and obvious byproducts of our poor decisions. So we always say, I want to be blessed. Oh, I don't want to be cursed. Okay. Then we still end up choosing and making decisions that produces the natural and obvious byproducts of having chosen poorly. Uh, there's a phrase that um, you'll find in, in, um, that comes out of Matthew, Matthew chapter 1, the chapter in which many of us, when we get to that in our reading plan, we just overlook. We go, oh, that's all the begats, right? This guy begat this guy. This guy begat this guy. And we have all the grandpa and son, grandma, mom, on, down, on down the line. Okay, like begets like. That's what I want you to understand. If we make decisions, poor ones, and continue to walk in that progressively, then what's going to happen is we're going to reap the natural and obvious byproducts of those decisions. Let me, let me take you to Dr. Phil. We've done that. Here we go. So he says, so, so how's that working for you? So how's that working for you? In other words, wait a second. We, we all would say we want to be blessed, and yet we do things that actually produce curse in our life, okay? So there's our first thing we got to juxtapose. Let's move to the second. Let's keep working through the text. That's all we're going to do is just kind of a, a kind of expository walk through this scripture. Let's talk about the next one. Trust in man versus trust in the Lord. That's the next parallel. You're, you're going to be blessed if you trust in the Lord, Okay? You're going to be cursed if you trust in man. One produces blessing, the other produces a curse. And I think, and I've really, really thought about this uh, uh, over and over over this last week, and I feel like it's kind of this revelation. I don't get revelations any more than anyone else could, because if you're just walking with God, he's just going to say things. But as I was praying, I was thinking about this, and I realized, man, this is true. This is true. I think that we are living under a, a, a massive curse as a, as a people, and that curse, it's multifaceted, but I think one of the major kind of points of this curse is, now let me just say it, and I'll see if it sinks in somewhere, it, it's anxiety. I, I, think, I think it's anxiety. And when we trust in man, the product of that, the byproduct is anxiety. But when we trust in the Lord, there's peace. There's peace. Let me, let me illustrate this way. It, over the last 10 days, I have witnessed, and not just witnessed, but have been intimately and uh, aggressively and closely involved in two really weird and scary acts of rage. Road rage that turned into parking lot rage that turned into just craziness. Two of them within the last like 10 days. Uh, I, and I won't go into the whole story. It'd take too long. It's just, it was just wild. Just driving along, minding my own business. All of a sudden, we went the car just darting in and out, chasing a guy, an elderly man that just kind of inadvertently cut him off as he was trying to pull out. Oh, and we followed him, we, me and my buddy. We just followed him. We're like, we got we to make sure these guys are going to be okay. Pulled into the parking lot of Ross as he got out of his car, slammed his door, and ran up and down every row of cars looking for this guy. His fists were literally like this. You could see the rage in his eyes. We're like, oh, we got our phone out. We're like, 911, we're ready to just dial it. And we waited and we followed him slowly through the parking lot. We're like, is this going to happen? Do I have to get out of the car and just go face off this guy? Just to save the life of this elderly man, he ended up not finding him. He got back in his car, he slammed it, and he peeled out. And he drove about 45, 50 miles an hour out of the parking lot and just headed down Wallace. We said to ourselves, not sarcastically, just prayerfully, we said, Lord, protect his wife. Lord, protect his kids. Seriously. We're like, this guy's going home hot. 
And I don't know what's going to happen. If he was willing to do that there, I don't know what he's doing at home. And then the second one just had to get involved with a guy who just got out of his car and started yelling and screaming, strangely, at Roth's again. <laughs> what's happening there? What's going on? And I went in and I bought the stuff that I needed to, to, to buy after kind of averting this thing and getting him on the road again and said, get out of here, get out of here, leave, leave this guy alone. And he left. I went in and I bought this stuff. And as I was walking out, sirens were flying, just an ambulance and fire truck, just whoa, just going crazy down the road. And I got in my car and I set my stuff in the back seat and I got in the front and I'm like, I audibly said, God, what is going on? And then I said it again. No, God, like, what is, like, what's really going on in the spiritual realm beyond what I'm seeing? Because this is chaos right now. It's chaos. And I knew the Lord instructed my heart. Here's what he very, very clearly said. My people have an inability to sufficiently deal with anxiety. And that word sufficiently was, was a key thing. I'm like, why would I? I don't think of the word sufficiently. I'm like, I would have just thought, well, people can't deal with anxiety. No, they can't sufficiently deal with anxiety. And if we put our trust in man, it's going to equal rage. When we put our trust in God, it equals peace. Here's the next phrase that I want to look at. That is that we would draw strength from the flesh, or like the scripture says, mere flesh, or we would put our confidence in him. Okay, as we're looking at this mirror, these are the things that are coming together, folded in half, and they line right up. Drawing strength from the flesh versus placing confidence in God. Okay, when you look at verse 9, in uh, Jeremiah 17, it says, the heart is deceitful above all things. How many know that to be true? Deceitful, okay? And then the question that, the, the song, uh, that Jeremiah asks is, is, who can understand it? Like, who can understand this heart? It's so deceitful. It just kind of messes with you, and it gets twisted, and it gets sideways. And, and then I look at Psalm 73, and it's verse 26. It says, my flesh and my heart may fail. It may. As a matter of fact, let's, it will. Let's just be even more blunt than the psalmist. My heart and my flesh will fail. But here's this phrase, but God is my portion and my strength forever. Okay? Our heart and our flesh will fail. It will. Guaranteed. Right? It will. That was an old commercial I just pulled out somewhere. I don't know. Guaranteed. Back to John Wimber of the Vineyard Movement. He says one of the best ways to overcome evil is to crowd it out with goodness. So I think about drawing strength from the flesh. Man, if your life is filled up with mere flesh, there's, gonna not, there's not a whole lot of room for confidence in God. But if you want to go the opposite way, this will change your life. When you continually fill yourself up with confidence in the Lord, the flesh just doesn't have room. There's no more room. Uh, I'll, I'll illustrate it the way Jesus illustrated it. It was Matthew chapter 12, very interesting and I'll even admit confusing passage of Scripture. Matthew chapter 12, he tells a story of an impure spirit coming out of a person, okay? The, the impure demonic spirit came out of a person, and then he tells the, the story, goes on to say, and the spirit came back and saw that the house, in the house in the scripture is the picture of a person, saw that the house was empty, so he went and got his even more wicked seven spirits, so seven more wicked, and you think to yourself, well, what's more wicked than a wicked spirit? You know, I mean, they're all wicked, but he gets seven more. So now there's eight evil spirits, Jesus tells the story, and they come back to this empty house, and they occupy it. They just take it over. Now, what's happening here? This is really interesting. I think the key word in this whole text here is the word empty, Okay, the spirit left this person, left the house, okay, and the Bible even says it was swept, but it was empty. And I wonder if we've got to take a look at what we're getting filled up with, okay? It's not just about um, sin management. It's not just about flesh management, okay? I had a great conversation with an alcohol and drug counselor right after service last night who said this, I talk to my students, these boys that I, that I counsel, and I say, listen, if this isn't about you liking pot less. 
It's that you got to like something else more. Okay, we can't just like pot less. And then he even goes on to say, you love it, don't you? You love it. So I'm not going to tell you to like it less. I'm going to talk to you about how you can get filled up more with something else. So our house, yes, the spirit may have left, but our house ends up being empty until we fill it up with confidence in the Lord. Not just sin management, not just flesh management, not just white knuckled. And some of you know what I'm talking about. This white knuckled, I can do this, I can do this. Friends, we can't do this. AA had something right here when they said, we are, we are powerless against this. We've got to come to Jesus and find our confidence in him, and then the flesh gets crowded out. Okay? Everyone with me so far? Okay. Let's move to the next. We're just going to keep looking here. Let's talk about wastelands. Let's talk about the bush in the wastelands versus the tree planted by the water. This is a huge uh, comparison here. All right? So one of them, the Bible says, will not see prosperity right when it comes to them. They won't even see blessing. They are dry, they're weary, and they just look at it and go, you could fix me, but I don't, I don't even want you now. The other one sends its roots out deep into a nearby stream. Okay, hard question. Don't raise your hand, but think about it. Which one are you? Which one are you? Admittedly, let's think about this. Are you the one that's the bush in the wasteland and when prosperity, when blessings coming, you're like, I'm so dry, I don't even know how to receive this. Or are you the one that's putting your roots down and the stream is starting to feed and water your soul? Uh, Paul says this to the church in Ephesus. This is Ephesians um, it's chapter three. It's a very familiar passage, the one um, that talks about the height and the depth and the length and the breadth of the love of God, okay? It's that passage. But Paul says this. Let me summarize. He says, I pray that your roots would grow down deep into God's love and keep you strong. That's his prayer, in essence. If you just take those three verses, 14 to 19 or so, you would go, here's my prayer, Paul says, I'm praying that your roots would go down deep. They would grow down deep into God's love and would keep you strong. Here's been my experience, okay? My experience over my lifetime, as short as it's been, this Christian journey that I've been on, it almost always begins and ends with a revelation of the reality of God's love. Okay, that was pretty good. We better make sure we're catching that. Okay? This Christian journey, I, my experience is, and it may, it may not be your experience, but I bet you once you really mused on this more, you'd go, yeah, that's me too. It begins and ends with a revelation of the reality of God's love, the Father. The Father. Once you grab onto that, and once it's, the, it's where you start, and it's where you never mature from it. If you ever find people that say, well, I've just matured beyond that, you know, that, that, that father-like love, me being a child to the father, I've matured and grown up. No, you haven't. No, you haven't. You can't grow past that. The father's love is so deep. How deep is the father's love for us that he would lavish it upon us, his children? And that love that we're talking about, that's the stream, friends, you put your roots down into that and you go deeply, it'll change your life. I guarantee you, it will change your life. Otherwise, you'll be a bush in the wasteland just being blown all around. And, and here's the overflow. If you look at Ephesians 3 again, the overflow is that we would be filled to the fullness of God. So when we really understand this and the love of God goes deep into our roots, then what happens is the overflow of that is, is we are so full of the power of God his blessing on our lives and, and this mark upon us. But here's the deal, friends. Do not seek the power of God. Don't seek it. It sounds like it's heresy I just said, but it's not. Here it is. Seek his presence. You have to seek his presence. The power is just the overflow of that, okay? So don't seek after power. You may look at some of your friends and go, man, they're such powerful Christians. They do really cool things. They lay hands on the sick and they recover. Don't seek after those things. Jesus even said it. Don't look for a sign, don't look for all these signs. The disciples would go to Jesus all the time. Do another miracle. Do it again, God. Do it again, God. You know that kind of thing? We want to see cool stuff. No, don't look for that. Look for his presence. Yeah. Let's keep moving. Number five. That we would dwell in the parched places of the desert or we would have leaves always green. Okay, there's what we have to wrestle with. And by the way, our leaves would be green even 
in uh, a drought, even when there's drought. So loved ones, here's the deal. There's always going to be seasons of drought. We all will have them. We all struggle through it. I've been through them personally. You know that. We go through them as family members. We go through them as a church. If everything's awesome, then nothing's awesome. We can't always be up here. We have to deal with the down here's and the here's. But don't fear when heat comes, when drought comes. Why? Here's what Psalm says, 27.1. The Lord is my light, my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is my stronghold. Whom shall I be afraid of? Why, why shouldn't we fear when drought comes or heat comes? Well, Psalm 27, 13, I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Amen. Okay? And this leads me to my final statement that I discovered. And that has to do with the salt land where no one lives or that you would be a person that never, ever fails to bear fruit. The salt land where no one, no one lives or nothing lives or you would be a person that never fails to bear fruit. Let me, let me tell you this. Uh, a couple months ago, Denise and I went down to Southern California. Someone said, hey, you can stay at our house down here uh, for a few days just for R&R. So we went. And we looked on the map because we'd never been there before. We looked on the map and we're like, wow, look at this. A big body of water over here. We should drive that way. About a half hour, 40 minutes, we should drive over there. And so we read up on it. And we're like, oh, this is cool. It's called the Salton Sea, and we, we need to go there, and we should check it out. We want to go walk the, the beach line, and we'd like to go into town, have some lunch, do all kinds of stuff, just hang out with the other tourists that are there. We're excited to visit it. Okay, here's what we saw when we got there. Here's what we saw. It looked relatively like this, <laughs> except what was missing from this picture was as you'd walk, you would be, you'd look down and you're like, what is this on the ground? It was thousands and thousands and thousands of dead tilapia everywhere. Fish just everywhere. They thought they could live in this and they couldn't. Why? Because this was 234 feet below sea level and its uh, salinity level is, is, is greater than that of the Pacific Ocean in this. Nothing lives there. And we drove around the town. We just went there for like 10 minutes. We're like, gross, it stinks. Let's get out of here. can't believe we drove this far to see this. We thought maybe the town is better. And we drove around the town. It was no better. It reflected that. Depressed, broken little town. Now, compare that as I finish to Revelation chapter 22. When Eden gets restored. In the presence of God, the scripture says in Revelation 22, there's a river that flows from his throne, and on each side of this river is a tree, and on that tree is fruit that is born every month, and its leaves are for the healing of the nations. This is crazy. I'd love to tell you about the story of Jesus and the fig tree. We don't have time, though, but you can research that and study that out. What an incredible, incredible thing. You think, how does something bear fruit every month? It's the presence of God. That's how it happens. But God. But God. And I want to just leave you with this. And um, you may want to write it down. You may not. It's, it's just something to settle into your heart as we finish. Friends, the depth and the health of the root will determine the quality and volume of the fruit. Okay, so if you're looking and saying, why don't I have fruit in my life? Don't look at the fruit. Look at the root. Okay? So the health and the depth of your root will determine that fruit. All right? And this is where we get to come to the Lord. Maybe you can just set your Bibles aside just for the next few moments to say, um, you can have it all, Lord, like we sang. Why don't you just close your eyes and just, just settle this with the Lord? Mm -hmm.